Okay. Or business, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. The little numbers showing up. Finally. Okay, good. Okay, maybe you could uh, tell me your name. My name is Barbara, and middle initial M stands for Mary Valdez. And your maiden name? My maiden name was Robert. It's a Welsh name, but it was my father's, stepfather's name. So the family name was Acker, A-K-E-R, which is a Norwegian name. So you're not Welsh? Not Welsh. <laughs> French, I mean Norwegian and uh, Irish. Norwegian and Irish, good. Okay. So um, this is an interview about, specifically about growing up as a woman and changes that we've seen as you've grown up uh, in the way women have been treated and how you've been treated as a woman and reflections in, in that in that manner. So I was wondering if maybe you could tell us about um, you know your family and growing up and your family structure. Growing up I had a mother and a father and two sisters and it was a very close, cohesive family. My father was probably the best father that anybody ever could have had because he was so involved as far as we were concerned in making sure that we got to uh, do things. We um, saw the kings and queens of Sweden and Norway because they came to Minnesota and Minneapolis and he would take us to the parades through town. We spent three hours for the Shrine Parade and the American League and Legion Parade downtown Minneapolis when it was big time. He heard about Howard Hughes flying around the world and we dashed out to Old Chamberlain Field to see Howard Hughes taking off. And he just heard it on the radio as he was eating his breakfast into the car and off to the wow. airport. So he was... Uh, very supportive. My mother was a very smart lady, probably ahead of her time, but of course as uh, uh, women grew up at that time they couldn't do uh, what they wanted to do. She uh, worked for a uh, biologist in the health department in Minneapolis. She worked? Until she married. I see. And then during the war she took over as office manager for my father's uh, business because there was no help available sometimes. Mm -hmm. This was uh, during what? What do you? What do you do during <laughs> World War Two? <II? laughs> during World War Two, and um, so uh, you had two sisters and two sisters, these three girls yeah. in the family. Yeah. And, um, so how how was the family structured? It was it was dad uh, in charge of everything and. Or how did that work? No, you know, it was almost even Stephen. I only remember one disagreement ever, and it was really very, very strange. Uh, my father loved sweets. In fact, it was probably what killed him. He had an ulcer early on. And the things that ulcer patients ate at that time were the creams and the custards and the things that probably contributed to uh, a high cholesterol level. He was a very intense person, slim and trim, but most likely had his arteries clogged from the thing. I mean, it was cream on his cereal in the morning. It was uh, sweet. And as I was saying, the disagreement was because my mother did not have one night, she duplicated the dessert we had had the night before and he said he didn't care how many times he had to eat roast beef, but by God, he was going to have a different dessert every night. <laughs> That's the only thing you can remember. The, uh, the only disagreement that I could uh, ever remember, you know, family wow. disagreement. We did sit around the table every night and eat at a dining room table with, uh, you know, china and, and uh, silver and all of that sort of thing, passing around the... Uh, dinner and had big, big discussions all the time. My grandpa Lynch lived with us for a while and he was an Irish Democrat from South St. Paul, Minnesota, and my father was a Republican. And there would sometimes be arguments dealing with uh, um, politics because my grandpa would say, well, did you see what that Stassen did today? And Stassen was a man that was from South St. Paul, was governor of Minnesota at the time. 
and my father would become apoplectic as uh, grandpa mentioned the, what he considered the stupid thing that uh, Harold Stassen had done. Of course Harold Stassen did lots of funny things running for president for about <laughs> 10 times. Would give up. <laughs> yeah. well, and dyed his hair bright red as he grew older. <laughs> so, um, so your mother <coughs> worked in, in, the, in your dad. What was your dad's business again? And he worked for a, a um, part of L.C. Smith Corona, the part that sold typewriter supplies as opposed to typewriters. He was the branch manager. He had uh, salesmen working for him covering North and South Dakota, the northern part of Iowa, part of Wisconsin, the upper peninsula of Michigan. So um, your your sisters, were they older than you or younger? Both of them younger. Younger? Yeah. And so you were the, the oldest and you, and you went to college? Yes. At a young age? University of Minnesota. Uh, right out of high school? Yep. So how did, how, that was kind of a unique thing to do at the time, right? Yes, but you know, we were a reading family. I don't ever remember us uh, sitting around in the evening that everybody didn't have a, a book. And of course, the University of Minnesota was right there, so it was easily accessible as far as a streetcar ride away. Mm -hmm. And they just believed in, in college. Of course, at that time, women were either nurses, secretaries, or school teachers. <laughs> educated women. Yeah. Those are their careers. And that, that was, was the career track, boy. You know, it, it's so much better for women now because they have so many alternatives. Well, the whole world in front of them. But mm -hmm. uh, well, before we get, uh, how, how how was it growing up as a teenager, uh, being a woman? Uh, you know. Hey, we all were together. We were a neighborhood, and the boys and the girls all played. We played baseball together. We played football together. My mother saw my skirts flying up one day and I got a pair of bib overalls for the next football game because <laughs> she objected. There was just, in the neighborhood where we lived, there was no differentiation among people as far as girls and, and boys were concerned. We all, you know, it was a neighborhood gang and you know, all played together. The most, um, the ones that were any different from us, one a, a block over was a gal by the name of Patty Berg who became the founder of the, the LPGA for women. She was a golfer and different. And then Bud Wilkinson who later became the uh, uh, coach at the University of El well he became an all-star at Minnesota. The Gophers were all-American, all Big Ten, all everything. But he became an outstanding coach at Oklahoma and uh, an outstanding ball player. But they all integrated too, except I would gaze adoringly at Patty Berg on Sunday morning when I she walked into church, the church that we went to for Mass and oh, she is so wonderful because, of course, at that time, uh, the LPGA was just starting and she was the outstanding golfer of the era. She was several years older than I, so I could stand there and gaze adoringly. Yes. And uh, so what, 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 this isn't one of my questions, but what church were you going to? Uh, at that time, we were going to Annunciation Church in... Uh, so it's yeah. a Catholic church. Catholic church, yeah. And um, so, I, you know, I mean, your your situation's a little different than what I was expecting, to tell you the truth, uh, from, from the era. Yeah, So because, uh, I mean, as far as neighborhoods and all concerned, we were integrated as far as boys and girls are concerned. In the high school, we were an academic high school. And, uh, was that a Catholic school too? No, it was a public school there, Washburn High in Minneapolis. It's changed now, but at that time we were the uh, low men on the totem pole as far as athletics were concerned, but very high academically. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, where, 
did you notice differences in the way your family operated with with the parents uh, being more egalitarian as opposed to other families? Well, Were you aware of it? Uh, not that much aware. We knew that there were certain things that girls did and certain things that boys did, but we were probably more integrated than anybody realized ever for the time. Because uh, so when did so you went to your parent? There was never a question of you going to college, I guess. No, and you were going to go to college, and they'd saved some money for you to go and. Off you went down the street to... Off I went down to the streetcar every morning and off to work. Now, one of my sisters grew up in an entirely different... I mean, not grew up, but when she married, it was an entirely different setup. She was subservient to uh, the male person the in the house. Yeah, Meryl had announced in kindergarten that this was the girl whom he was going to marry, my sister Kay Ray. And so he waited around until uh, uh, she was old enough. And then when he was going overseas with the, the uh, um, Marine Air Force, uh, they got married. And uh, she waited on him hand and foot for probably 40 years until he died. So it, that was an, a, a different model as far as uh, homes were concerned. She was staying at home and... It was not good for her. She should have been out of the house once in a while, but he wouldn't hear of it. She got a job once at a little candle shop in the neighborhood, and uh, he was horrible about it. And then she helped her as she grew older, as, and one of their daughters married. She helped out in Ron's shop, and Meryl was violent about that also. So uh, it was one family out of, uh, uh, my family that was uh, different from the way we had been growing up all the time. Were there discussions about that with her? No, never. She, uh, no, she became an alcoholic. <laughs> and then finally after he died, uh, and my mother contributed to it. My mother felt that he was from a very wealthy family in Minneapolis, but she felt that he had heart trouble and diabetes and he might die suddenly. So my mother sent money to her every month. And she was spending it on booze, you know, calling the neighborhood <laughs> drugstore <laughs> and having them do But she was a very quiet. Uh, and so after Meryl died, her children confronted her and... Uh, took her out to a fancy $3,000 a week place and she went in one door and out the other and she went to another place of her choosing and she probably hasn't had a drink for well maybe at least 10 years now I've forgotten exactly when Meryl died but she remarried again and lovely lovely man who died on Christmas Day last year which was that. but she's pulled out of it now and she's making a life for her Where does she live? Uh, outside of Minneapolis at a lake as far as you can get from Minneapolis without being in North Dakota or South Dakota <laughs> to escape her children. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't want to do that yet. But <laughs> so <laughs> no, they were so, uh, a couple of them so mean-spirited after she was marrying for the second time that I actually had to go back to Minneapolis and say, you know, cool it, because your father was a good father, but your mother is finally getting a chance to live a different kind of life, go fishing, which Meryl thought was a very uh, proletarian. I mean, who goes fishing if they're, you know, my family riding a bicycle? Who goes bicycle riding? He'd had a car, a new car at age 16. So she finally started doing the things that, that we had gone fishing. We spent our summers at the lake and done those sorts of things. And, you know, once she married, <laughs> well, um, I'd like to shift now to, um, the college years, okay, and um, and after right after college, I guess going to work and that that period, and your relationship to 
your your thoughts about you know that that situation and and uh, observing women. And well, I I started out teaching with um, uh, not a full credential because I was coming from Minnesota to California, and I even though I had a my uh, uh, my minor area was political science and history, they didn't accept that in California, so I had to do. California state and local government <laughs> all over again. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, I did observe, although the war had helped women uh, uh, get out of their shells, etc., I, I noticed that in some areas it was still uh, uh, difficult. It was difficult for me on my first job as a uh, uh, Catholic because the school board was another religion. The superintendent had changed his religion so that it matched the school board. And I was uh, teaching across the tracks where the uh, Mexican-American population was. They felt that. And they didn't realize that they had a Catholic in their midst. So they were really, you know, for no known reason. So I've been early on discriminated be against because of of that only reason. The only other time discriminated because I have a Spanish surname and they expect to see uh, in job interviews or other thing a nice little Chicano lady or even the doctor coming in to check on me reading my uh, uh, x-rays and everything rounded the corner and you know, was kind of taken aback because he saw me and, you know, face of Ireland. Mrs. 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 <laughs> <laughs> this is horrible. <laughs> so instances of, of uh, uh, interviewed by a man at CSUS for a job, for a group of people, fortunately. And uh, they had already decided who was going to get the job, but they needed to interview three persons, so I was one of the three. And he was taken aback when he saw me, and two people whom I knew were on the interview panel, and they realized that the job was wired. So in, after I had left, they talked to the uh, fellow who was doing the hiring, and job is canceled because obviously you're, I mean they came to my defense, I was the most qualified but the guys had wired it for happened to be a Mexican American fellow whom they wanted in the job and I didn't fit the mold obviously. <laughs> well, that's another issue I, th I think we could talk about for a second is your husband and how my you met your husband. And my husband, I met my husband in Tracy and he worked for his uncle. So you came out here first to get a job? Yes, yes. What brought you out to California? There were jobs. I had never been away from home. Adventurous? You got and they were advertising for jobs. And I had, well, I had worked uh, summer jobs there. I worked for uh, Land Lakes Creamery. And amazingly enough, translating their letters from South America the the letters that came in to wanting butter and cream <laughs> dairy products sure. from there and uh, that was fine because my Spanish is different from the Spanish that I encountered in California. Mm -hmm. I do not speak Spanish here because I my Spanish is Castilian and, and these people speak a different brand of Spanish so mm -hmm. It's just a case of not wanting them either not to understand me or make fun of, you know, my pronunciations and everything. So, so you met your husband there at, in that job? In Tracy, yes. He was, I was working across the tracks and he was, uh, and he watched me going to school every morning and so finally uh, wangled an introduction. <laughs> and how, how did that go over a uh, um, mixed marriage at that point? Well, you know, it was really, really strange because my family didn't think anything of it. And, of course, his family had been in the United States for more than a hundred years. They had been among the original settlers in San Benito County. Um, 
some of my relatives in Minnesota talked about Barbara marrying a foreigner. They didn't realize that his family had been in the United States longer than their families <laughs> had been in the United States from Norway and Ireland. My mother's grandfather, my great-grandfather, had come over from Ireland with the potato famine and he came a lieutenant in the Union Army because they must have just taken these guys right off the boat, some of them, who will, because from 1846 when he arrived until the Civil War, you know, he had a job. Then he was a foreman for James J. Hill building the railroad across the United States. Uh, got as far as uh, Sibley, Iowa, and his mother, uh, his wife, and 12 children later said, enough is enough. So he went up to Minneapolis and he worked in the yards there. My grandpa Lynch worked for the railroad uh, in South St. Paul. So that part of the history was railroad. My father's family had all been uh, farmers in the uh, east. They were the first settlers in the eastern part of South Dakota. Ole Rolvog has written a book about giants in the earth, about the Norwegian settlers, too, that were my, my father's family. And the world goes full circle. One of my brothers-in-law was an alcoholic, stopped drinking, got to AA because he had always thought that he was too good. I mean, his father was head of one of the big grain companies in Minneapolis. You know, I don't need to go to AA. Well, between the age 40 and 50, after he uh, joined AA, he made enough money to retire at age 50, move up to northern Minnesota. But the former governor of um, Minnesota also was his neighbor up there, Carl Rolvog, who was related to the Rolvog who had written Giants in the Earth. And my brother-in-law and Carl started uh, AA units up in northern California, I mean northern Minnesota. Nobody came the first winter that they were having the meetings because they had the meetings in the social hall in this little town, and it was the Catholic Church social hall. <laughs> Scandinavians are very suspect <laughs> of that, but uh, it worked out. After that, people coming out of the woodwork doing the things, and when my sister died, Everybody in town, including the Lutheran minister, were at her uh, funeral because she and Jim anonymously did lots of good works in the town because they had the money to do it. So, so the world goes round and round. Right. <laughs> but that's that, that's interesting. And uh, your your daughter is the head of the women's studies. At UC Santa, at the UC Santa Cruz. And that's yeah. interesting. I I would I I, I was actually suspecting. To tell you the truth, just the you know, I was I was expecting in our interview that I would find out that you were someone who was breaking out of the mold, that that you were you were in the you know you were insisting on these rights. Oh, I insist on my rights. I insist on my rights. That's the problem I'm having at this moment. So we, I mean, well, back in I mean, back in the earlier days of being married and living in Sacramento and things. Did, did you have to insist on your rights as a woman to do I did, I did. And my husband was disconcerted at first because uh, his mother, until she died, and she was over 100 years old just a couple of years ago when she died, never once expressed an opinion. Never once expressed an opinion of her own. Mm -hmm. Carmen, uh, what would you like? Uh, this dress or this dress? Oh, it doesn't matter. Carmen, what would you like? Would you like chicken or beef? Oh, it doesn't matter. I mean, even such mundane things as that, I don't think I ever recall her saying. So, of course, my husband, coming from that environment where uh, the father, although he died uh, when my husband was very young, just before he went into the Marine Corps, um, was used to that subservience on the part of females. And so when I had to express my opinion, <laughs> and I expressed it often, 
-hmm. <laughs> you don't come from a good Irish family without <laughs> expressing opinions. He he was taken aback, but he finally came to realize that you know I was entitled to my opinion too, and he was entitled to, and he'd just say, "Barb, stop arguing." I'd say, I'm not arguing, I'm discussing this. I am not arguing, <laughs> I'm discussing <laughs> But that was growing up. We discussed things at the dinner table. My sister Shirley got so incensed one night about something that was happening that my poor father got a mouthful of mashed potatoes because she just exploded, not meaning to explode the mashed potatoes all <laughs> over. But we were just used to it as kids. And I think it's from that sort of an ambience where everybody had a chance to talk about anything and everything, including Grandpa Lynch, who wanted to talk about stuff. <laughs> right, right, and opinions. So th in the 1950s when you were teaching, and you s your children were in the growing up, the 50s, yeah. what kind of challenges did you face being, you know, te you, did you teach all through I your taught. I uh, went an hour before my daughter was Joan was born, mm -hmm. and she claimed she was born on the gurney going down to the <laughs> delivery room, but she lies a lot. I was the gurney was in the delivery. Room. We made it to the delivery room. So. <laughs> so that yeah, but you know Martin was very supportive as far as helping out, and I had a couple wonderful babysitters. Mm -hmm. You don't get those kinds of persons anymore. These uh, two women at different times as the kids were growing up were wonderful. I could write a book about trying to hire babysitters because I mean I found all kinds and colors of people out there looking for work and of course right after the war they were I had a German war bride who had my kids so upset that uh, because she was still living in the uh, Germany but with the United States money and everything and and uh, it was very difficult to find people but once I found these two different ladies at different times they were supportive I could go to school to get the classes that I needed for the California a credential. I needed to take a music class, even though a sister, somebody, and I had labored over the piano for ten years as I was growing up. I have no musical sense at all. I love music, love to hear it and of it, but I cried every Saturday morning over the uh, piano in the convent, and she cried harder than I did. Sounds like a nightmare. So. <coughs> Your children, when they were infants, would stay at home at these in-home in caregivers, yes. and that was affordable? It was affordable at that time because you didn't pay them that much. One of them I paid Social Security on. It was a whole different, whole different everything different as far as money was concerned. and as far, I wasn't getting very much. For ten years I worked in a parochial school and I had to fight every year to get a raise because Monsignor just didn't, he didn't believe in women but he had to take me because there was <laughs> nobody else available. <laughs> so how, how where, how where, I mean, you, you lived, your life spans the suffrage up to present day and how aware were you and were you active at all in women's movement? I was not active, only demanding Your own rights. my own rights as far as that was concerned. Sometimes being shot down and sometimes getting... But my mother had told us that everybody had to put first one leg in a stocking and then the other leg in a stocking. So there was no discrimination as far as people are concerned. She felt very, very strongly about that. You could not discriminate uh, among people or between people. So I think that was probably a carryover from from that time. Right. Well, um, how did this is off the subject, but uh, how do you, how do you think your your daughter get, got 
uh, in that direction that she would be headed towards women's Well, history. I think it's just that going to school and seeing what the role of women uh, should be mm -hmm. just made her realize. And, and uh, she's married to a fellow who's very militant about lots of things. He doesn't like the separation that they have now. He living in Ukiah and she living in Santa Cruz. They trade off weekends as far as that's concerned. But he knows that there's going to be an end to that because he's just trying to make enough money so that he can live on his rentals in Ukiah. And they have a condominium in, in uh, uh, Santa Cruz. So I think it was just the idea that, you know, women have equal rights. And Jim realized that, her husband. You know, he didn't have to be educated as far as that was concerned. And she's just felt very strongly, as did her friends. She went to a parochial high school, and she saw that women could be role models, uh, uh, staffed by both nuns and lay people. And they, ladies of Loretto are militant ladies. <laughs> Aware of that. <laughs> um, so did you did did you uh, do you feel like you had any part in this? Did you well probably you? because uh, they were uh, having not being left alone, but they had to do some decision making on their own as they were growing up. You know, are you going to uh, uh, wear this today or wear that today? You know, you have no choice. You wear the uniform, but. We never left Rhodes Department Store without being in a fight over Sunday go to meeting clothes because they had definite, the girls had definite viewpoints. And of course, I was always a little more conservative as far as dress is concerned. And, and you know, Berta was very petite, and it was hard at that time to find things that they didn't have petite clothes. So she always wanted to wear something that I considered a little too sophisticated. Mary, the second daughter, had big boobs, and it was hard to find clothes for her growing, you know, high school age that catered to. Things have changed since then, though. A lot of things have changed. And Joan, you know, carried her own revolving door when she went to American River College. She'd go in one way, and <laughs> she thought the days counted as far as matriculation was concerned. No, no, Joan. <laughs> it isn't days. And then the youngest, uh, Joan, or older by a couple years, or Jane, older by a couple years, teaches at Sutter Middle School, and of course she's, you know, in your face if you get onto her. So, you know, the girls are all very, very sure of themselves and militant about their rights as far as. Uh, females are concerned in a <coughs> female male community. Yeah, have you experienced any disconflict between males and females? Uh, either watching uh, your daughters in their lives, have they had this conflict? Uh, well, very often? Uh, no, not very often. I think sometimes that their spouses would like them to be a little less militant feeling, but they, you know, don't openly voice. Uh, a lot of that, so mm -hmm. uh, maybe they're afraid of them or afraid of their mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> got under control, huh? <laughs> well, let's see. Um, okay, so uh, let's see. Let me s just review here real quick. How do you view the institution of marriage? Well, of course, my background would uh, make you know that I believe in marriage, although at this stage of the game, I'm not questioning anything. I realize that uh, especially older people live together because they'd lose out on pensions or whatever if they got married, so I have no problem as far as uh, that's concerned because I have several friends who are in uh, that category. Companionship after my father died, my mother said the thing that she missed most was being able to go out to dinner and with somebody, you know, and, and have a nice meal, except with her kids when she went out with them. 
and just uh, little things like that. I, I, um, it's hard on children when there is no either significant other person in the household or if there's any uh, complete disappearance as far as that's concerned. But if people are happy living together and not inflicting uh, uh, conflict on the kids, you know, so what else is new? Right. Well, have you had any, uh, you, you've been a Catholic your whole life, that it hasn't ever been challenged or changed. Um, how do you view your religion and its expectations for women? And is it conflict? How, how do you view religion? There, there is conflict as far as many women's groups are concerned because they feel that it's uh, uh, too, the hier hierarchy is too sexist. I have, you know, no problem with it at all. The only thing I have uh, any problem with as far as any of these things is concerned, and that's because I go with the church point of view on that, I am diametrically opposed to abortion. I cringe when it even comes up as a, a topic because I do think that uh, I've seen too many instances, especially when I've uh, filled in at the high school, continuation school, that sort of thing, where it's used as a means of birth control as opposed to, uh, you know, common sense, just hang out or go to the store and buy something or do anything, using it uh, uh, as a means of uh, a birth control. I'm mm -hmm. scared of it. Mm -hmm. Or as any means, I mean, you know, think before you leave girls. <laughs> Well, and guys. <laughs> okay, how do you think? Uh, excuse me. <coughs> how do you think society views women's place, and has that changed over the years? Well, it's changed, but there are still areas where uh, you know it's very, very difficult. People are suspect in some uh, areas, as far especially those professions that have been very, very masculine through the years. Uh, there's, you know, you see a lady as a carpenter, and oh, I'm not sure about that. A lady as an engineer, oh, I'm not sure about that. We've accepted ladies as attorneys and lawyers. In fact, I have a female attorney myself. But there are some areas where there's still a little tension. Mm -hmm. Well, going back just a second to the marriage issue again. Do you think the two-way Turner family on an institution of marriage and family uh, has? Do you think? What do you think about that? Do you think? How, have you viewed people how they're living now and to to both well, parents? Well, I think that those people, men and women, who are willing to share the thing. If a woman has to take time off. I think the man has to take time off if we're talking about babysitting or child care or something like that. It's not fair to inflict it just on one or the other. There should be sharing as far as uh, that responsibility is concerned. And that's probably an area where I do feel very strongly because, you know, macho man, forget it. I mean, let's have macho woman too. <laughs> So, you know, that's where I have to think twice as far as uh, that's concerned. I was lucky because my husband did share. Now, he couldn't share because when you're working for a for-profit company such as Lucky Stores, you can't be that flexible. I remember when I called him and said the doctor said when Joan was being born that I had to get to the hospital. I had actually worked that day because uh, the, the nun who was the 8th grade teacher was supposed to take over for me that last week was um, uh, practicing for, high, for graduation and I thought, oh, I can't, I can't ask her to do this. I can't. So I waited until the last minute and Dr. Schluter said, you get to the hospital. So I called my husband, oh, we have to go to the hospital. He says, God damn it, Barb, I told you not to wait until the last minute. So we, he came home and we dashed down there. But, you know, that's just one of the things. Um, when they hired me at Holy Spirit, 
I had been in a public school and they uh, just didn't believe in pregnant teachers in the public schools at that time, you know, scams. And I said, Sister, I am pregnant. I said, I want you to talk to Monsignor and I want you to talk to the parents and see if that's an acceptable thing for them. She called me back ten seconds later and said, it's all right, it's all right. And jo Jane was born around Christmas time, so I had Christmas vacation and all of that. The parents there were extremely supportive, absolutely fantastic parents. But they were all upper middle class, uh, professional people. I, I can't get over how supportive they were in the whole thing into uh, even building a platform for my desk to be on. Even though I roamed the aisles, they went, now you, you know, sit quietly and you can, well, you can't teach from sitting quietly, but that's the sort of support that I had from those people. So, can't fall they, down. They, were, they probably hadn't seen this happen to, to us. <laughs> Never before! <laughs> Since I was the only, <laughs> the only lay teacher at the time. Well, do you think that the two-income family uh, has a, had a negative or uh, impact, impact on I children? Think, I think that it's very, very difficult unless there are some ways to build in the times that there is a parent around or easily available or something like that. Because we've got kids going, uh, you know, every which direction because there is no one. My David um, went with me every single day from about 2.30 on because I'd get home and the other kids would be off with their friends and on their own in the neighborhood because they couldn't go farther than... I had constraints as far as where they could go. And Steve, uh, David was well versed on every fire station in Sacramento County because he... I'd go around and taking him, he liked fire stations. And the other kids said, well, David was your favorite. I said, no, I took him with me in defense of David because you would have killed him if you'd had <laughs> to babysit him or take him with you. And so I had no recourse except to plop in the car and take him grocery shopping with me, take him to, and then we'd add others. And I did take the kids every weekend. We did you know, excursions and different things, so. Okay, so I have, uh, let's see, just a few more questions. Um, do you think male and female relationships have changed during your life? Well, they've changed in that women have to be accepting of some things about men and men have to be accepting of some things about women. Yes, you've gone from the macho male, subservient female to the, you know, sharing, we hope. Working toward that. Yeah, yeah. Still okay. it's, it's still, you know, a little off kilter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're not quite there yet. Now, I look at your own situation sure. and analyze that. Well, yeah, I guess I could, but... Yeah, I'm where trying, are we? <laughs> I'm trying to keep my bias out of this, but... Okay. Um, no, but I mean, when you're thinking about it, you just think about that in terms of how far you've gone and how far your wife has gone. Oh, yeah. It's been... Yeah. Um, so... Okay. Why, uh, do you like being a woman and why? Oh, yes, I like being a woman because I like doing... Um, the things that I'm doing that, you know, I've been geared to be doing for all these many years. Uh, I don't know what I do as a male. As a female, I want to leave teaching and become the secretary in the governor's office because when I go down there, I was legislative chairperson for the Reading Association for a number of years and would go down and observe there. And she was always sitting looking so pretty and so neat and so clean and so manicured and so uh, hairdo and all of that. I thought, oh, God, it's nothing like teaching school. <laughs> nothing like it. 
So were there opportunities in your life, that you, things that you wanted to do in your life that you were not able to do because of expectations of, of, of the time for women's Not careers? because of expectations of the time, but because of marriage, because of children, because of some of these other things. But, of course, you make choices in life. And, you know, I wouldn't give up. Which one of my kids would I give up? Or all of them would I give up? I mean, I don't have an ideal family, but I have as close to an ideal as you can get. And, you know, no thanks uh, to me, but thanks to uh, uh, the whole bailiwick as far as that was concerned. Everybody. Well, what was, there, was there something in your life that you wanted to accomplish that you didn't accomplish? A specific goal or a specific job you wanted other than that? Well, you mean other than the secretary's yeah. job down in the governor's <laughs> office? I can't think of anything offhand, Kurt. I really can't. So you didn't want to be a doctor when you came out of high think school? Think of anything. Had to settle for No, I didn't. My father uh, was hoping maybe that uh, he had a female as an attorney that maybe I'd be interested in that. Uh, my mother thought that maybe I should uh, uh, become a dietitian, which was a female job at the time. But there was no great, you know, I taught school even with my sisters and my cousins. And so it was a natural thing. And of course, at the time, it was a natural thing. Yeah, it just fit nicely. Yeah. Well, then, um, uh, some quick questions, OK? So. What kind of music do you like and why? Well, I'm eclectic as far as that's concerned. I listen to all kinds of music. If the truth be known, however, I had a wonderful time a couple weeks ago in Branson, Missouri. <laughs> <laughs> and I did listen on my car radio for years to country western music, but there was a reason for it. I had to listen on my car radio because my husband was horrified by it. That was oaky type. And if you're from... San Benito County, the Okies were, you know, down on the rung as far as that was concerned. I like uh, country western music because it tells a story. There's a beginning and an end. And, you know, you hear Dolly Parton and she does a story. You hear Willie Nelson and there's a story involved in little vignettes in life. Three minutes. Yeah, three minutes and you're through. But I do listen to other things. I can um, tell you all about operas because I had all the music when I was sitting, sitting with Sister Imelda or whatever her name is, you know, learning um, things from the operas, just smaller pieces attuned to what I was capable of doing. I had to memorize the William Tell Overture for a uh, recital. So, uh, you know, I, I, done all sorts of things. I, I know opera as well. I know um, all kinds of music. And I think that's a plus because I am horrified over teachers who don't know the, what a bass clef is, don't know what a sharp is, don't know what a flat is, don't know what a treble clef is. I mean horrified. Okay. Um, is your uh, uh, I don't know if I asked this question. Did I did I ask you? Uh, did I ask you? Is, is, how is you, your experience different from your mother's experience? Well, as far as being a mother. Yeah, of course. Um, my mother was um, very good about allowing us to try and fail mm -hmm. along the way. I think she was ahead of her time as far as uh, that was concerned. Um, she lived to be 94 and she could do the New York Times crossword puzzle in an hour or so. She was extremely bright as far as well read and believed in education and did everything she could to uh, learn more all the time. There wasn't as much differentiation there as there would have been had I had a different mother. 
I mean, the difference between my sister, Kay Ray's m mothering, and her children. I mean, she was a mother, and of course she didn't dare do anything else except be a mother. See, I was a mother, and I did other things. Okay, um, do you have some goals? Yes, I do have Kurt. I was hired 13 years ago. And Lucille Barba hired me, asked me to come here. Nancy Brinelson hired me. Uh, I'm a reading specialist. I am the only reading specialist on this staff. I have waited 13 years to be invited to a meeting, monthly meeting of the reading specialist, and have not been invited. Mrs. Ms. Barba sends out the notice and I have never received one. I said, I told my children that as soon as I received an invitation to the reading specialist meeting, I'd quit because they say, Mom, you better quit. Ms. Barba is quitting. I haven't received the invitation yet. <laughs> That's my one goal. <laughs> Better be here for a while. <laughs> <laughs> it's up to them. <laughs> I won't tell. Uh, <laughs> what, are your, what are your regrets? Uh, well, one of the regrets I have had is that during the years that my children were growing up, my house was clean. I should have forgotten the damned house and you know it wasn't that I neglected them because weekends were devoted as far as they were concerned but I fussed about the dusting and would hire people to come in forget that that's the you know that's the big regret I have that I worried about dust I don't worry about dust anymore I have a supreme dust collection of 680 <laughs> If you'd like to come over and collect it. <laughs> Do some writing. Okay. Um, what are your wishes? Uh, just to survive. Just to survive. And make sure that uh, I don't inflict upon my children any long-lasting thing that would uh, cause them to worry about my health or about me. Or anything like that. When I want to, when I go, I want to go, as my mother did in her sleep at 94. Yes. Okay. Uh, no, that's the one thing I worry about. The fact that that, uh, and my son David has said, "Mom, you don't have to worry about us putting you in a home or anything, because with six of us, we should be able to uh, take care of you." Well, I don't want to be a burden upon anyone. So. Okay, um, what is the one thing you'd like people to say about you? Not even the one thing that I would say, and my kids in school have always said I was fair. I was absolutely fair. I didn't discriminate against kids. I didn't choose this one to be a messenger more than I chose the other one. I do the same thing with my children. I keep track of what they get for Christmas and things like that, I'm fair. Okay. Whether people think so or not. <laughs> um, what would you like people to remember about you? That I'm a survivor. <laughs> uh, what is the one thing you, that you'd like people to know about you? Oh. My life is an open book, Kurt. I can't think of anything that they don't know about me, as you found out in the last hour. <laughs> okay, and I'm gonna, this one I think we covered, so I'm going to go to the last question. You ready? Ready. Okay, what is the best and the worst thing that's ever happened? Oh, I can do five 
Well, probably the worst thing that happened to me was my father dying when he was 64 years old. He was looking forward so much to being 65 in June, and he died in October the previous year. Absolutely worst thing. I mean, other deaths along the way that have been traumatic, but that, that was the worst thing. So young. Hmm? So young. Yes, so young. Because he was just looking forward. The day before he died, he was had brought one of his salesmen out to the house. They lived on a lake, a suburban lake, and he was showing him his garden. The guy had collapsed on the street. And the salesperson brought him home, and there he is walking around, walking heart trouble probably, showing him his garden. Are you available tomorrow? No. And see, then the next day he's dead. Best thing? Best thing? My kids. Seems to be a common uh, and response from others. <laughs> okay. Very common. And, uh, okay. I have one more question. Okay. This is off the. the this is not part of my report, but um, hey, did you ever experience discrimination from other people with when you were with your husband? Yes, and it was funny because we were at a picnic one time in a backyard in North Sacramento, a principal retiring. And we were sitting there eating picnic lunch, and you know all of these people with whom I had worked for 20 years, and this elderly woman across the street, across the table from me, she was the mother of the one of the principals there, uh, looked at me, and uh, my husband was of course he loved to eat, so he was Frenchman. And he wasn't fat, he wasn't anything, he just liked to eat. And she says, does he speak English? <laughs> and I said, why don't you ask him? His family has lived here for more than a hundred years. And I thought, you stupid bitch. Oh, that was the worst. That was, yeah, the worst of it. I think pretty good. I mean, yeah. I mean that, that, yeah, that you've had a. That's amazing. Uh, there's so many things that I thought I would find in our discussion were different than yeah. what I, th I thought. Yeah. But uh, you see, I'm a modern woman. You are to a point. Very modern. <laughs> and you come from a modern background. Yeah. Modern. See, had I not had my mother and father who were believed in me. They believed in the three of us. It could have gone another way. It's amazing because uh, my background is much more um, uh, hi hierarchical in nature than my parents. My sister that I interviewed le last night, yesterday, she was five years, six years older than me. At this point. Um, so, um,